Hi, it's Dennis Daly. One of the most fun interviews I ever conducted was with the great singer Lou Rawls. Not only did he have this deep, luscious voice that was on the other end of the spectrum from my squeaky tenor voice, he turned out to be a funny, interesting guy. This is an unedited interview, just Lou and I sitting down, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Lou, thanks for taking the time to join us. I want to talk about uh, the special coming up and your involvement with the United Negro College Fund. Yes. How long have you been associated with that group? And and for those of us, and I just realized, I'm not sure how old it is. It goes Mm. back quite a way. Well, actually, it's, uh, I think it's celebrating about 50 years. I didn't get involved with it, though, until about, well, this is our 18th year of my telethon that I started to raise funds to help, you know, subsidize these colleges and also supply uh, uh, scholarships for deserving students. But I believe the UNCF itself actually started back in the 40s. And um, I got involved with them, as I said, well, this now is 18 years ago when I I, uh, signed with Anheuser with Budweiser as a spokesman for them for voiceovers on radio. And I had recorded the song you'll never find another love like mine at the same time so what happened was they started they would play the song and then they would run the commercial then they run the commercial and play the song so it got to be a pretty you know and uh what i say door opening thing and uh i was talking with august bush the third the chairman of the board who had just who had just taken over the company from his dad and he was aware of my community involvement, the work that I've been doing as far as schools and stuff like that. So he asked me, he said, is there anything we can get behind you on? And I said, well, yeah, I've been doing all these telethons for fundraisers for research. You know, the Jerry Lewis, the Hard Fund, the Arthritis Fund. So we're doing cell. everyone else's telethons. You know, I said, and everybody was saying this is for research. And one day I was thinking about it, and it just dawned on me, where did the researchers come from? <laughs> you know, and uh, so I told him, I said, you know, everybody's doing a thing for research. Why don't we do something for education to find the new researchers who perhaps have the answers to the problems we're confronted with? So he said, well, you know, being an alcoholic beverage, we've got limits as to what we can do. Mm-hmm. But I will have my legal department check it out to see if, you know, we can really, in fact, get behind you on it. So he called me. I was in, I think, Vancouver performing and he called and said that his legal department said it was okay so he flew out and met me in los angeles and we set it up and then i went to new york and told the people at the uncf i said uh, i want to give you some money they said how much i said as much as i can get you know they <laughs> said what do you mean i said well i want to do a real you know live like telethon you know and uh, raise money for education so we started it and of course the first couple of years it was kind of hard you know because Everybody, when you say UNCF, everybody thought you were talking about UNICEF. Said, yeah. mm-hmm. Do you give to UNCF? Oh, yeah, I give to UNICEF. I said, no, 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 not UNICEF, UNCF. And uh, it started off, and then, of course, my first few shows, I had uh, you know, a lot of great entertainers that came on board to help me out, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, you name them, they all came. And it just started to build. And so now here we are 18 years later, close to $200 million dollars that we've raised and close subsidized about 50,000 students. Mm. Did you have any problem early on getting clearances for stations? Was, oh, that, was that a problem? And I yes. can think in some areas 18 years ago it might yes, have been. Yes, buddy, believe me, it was an area, it was a problem all over the place, except where I had, you know, uh, I had, I guess you could say, already a great input. Mm-hmm. But because of the Anheuser-Busch, you know, involvement being, they were the founding sponsors, That opened a lot of doors for us, you know, because of them, Mm -hmm. and uh, especially in radio. And then when August decided that he wanted to put me on television to see, because when I started doing the voiceovers on radio, the sales increased. Of course, they were playing You'll Never Find, and then Drink a Bud, Mm -hmm. you know, Drink a Bud, You'll Never Find, right? (laughs) And uh, he said, well, Lou, let's put you on television and see what kind of response we get. 
So I started doing, uh, you know, visuals on television, on commercials, and uh, sales increased 44% in the Good black heavens. community. I have a real soft spot in my heart for St. Louis. I grew up in southern Indiana, and like most beginning disc jockeys, mm-hmm. you sit and babysit for St. Louis Cardinal baseball. Right. I spent most of my career waiting for the station ID every half hour. Uh, and, of course, it was all Budweiser and everything, right. and, and, and Bush Stadium, and Harry Carey used right, to do the game right, in St. Louis. Right. So, mm-hmm. so when you said St. Louis and Anheuser-Busch, it brought back a lot of memories yes. for me. So that's how it started with that. And, uh, of course, then it became, you know, it got down to, I guess you'd call it a grassroots situation because every city had their little, you know, little uh, UNCF representatives there. And mm-hmm. it gave them a chance to bring in the local community and the local people and the volunteers who have really made it what it is today. You know, you get your local people who get involved and get the local businessmen involved and so it becomes a real community involvement kind of situation. And uh, it has grown now. It's it's pretty big now. I mean, it's a, I, almost, I guess you could say it's almost an international thing now because we are on the BET mm-hmm. satellite, which now goes to the Caribbean and even into the European market. Who's the fellow who started that? Their headquarters was very near downtown Washington, D.C., where I lived for a long time. And, it started uh, BET. Uh, BET. I'm, I'm Bob just, Johnson. Bob Johnson. Right. And just really took a concept and just went gangbusters yes, with it. Yes, he did, and he's doing really good with it. And one thing, I do a show on there on BET called Jazz Central, where they bring in a lot of the jazz musicians that otherwise would never get exposed on television. You know, because, you know, they, they think, well, they say jazz. What is that, you know? not realizing that that is really one of the foundations and backbones of the music of today. But a lot of the great musicians, you know, uh, never get a chance to be seen on television. These guys now, because of this show, are getting that opportunity. And, uh, you know, the thing is that the, uh, I don't know why the industry always wants to keep jazz on the back burner. Mm -hmm. Not realizing that jazz, well, jazz, which is a derivative of blues, which is a derivative of gospel, you know, is all the foundation of all the stuff that's going on today. Well, until the mega marketing of of people like Prince or Michael Jackson or Madonna Mm -hmm. or whatever, Mm -hmm. particularly before the opening up of of countries behind the Iron Curtain, they would tune into the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, for jazz. I mean, it was America to them. Well, you know, I tell you, if you go to Europe right now, or, uh, you know, like to Holland, uh, Germany, you know, all those countries, France, all of, jazz is a predominant thing, not rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Jazz is a predominant music, because as far as the Europeans and the rest of the world is concerned, jazz is America's music. Yes, yes. You know, and... Um, One of the most receptive audiences I think I ever heard was Mm. on a Benny Goodman album Mm -hmm. playing at the World's Fair in Brussels. Now, this would have been 58, maybe. Probably, yeah. And and the audience was just hot. I mean, they they wouldn't let the man stop playing. That's right. Lionel Hampton still goes over there and does, God, enormous amounts of concerts. And they won't let the man up. Of course, he won't get off stage anyway. How old old is Lionel now? Dirt. (laughs) 80s? He got to be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still going. But he's still going. I mean, the man, I was over there. We were in, uh, what was it? Not Montrose, another one of the big festival areas. And the man got up on stage and played so long that his band, you hear me? His band got up and took a break. (laughs) And he was still playing and play. And they came back. He was still playing. (laughs) I mean, but that the people, the people wouldn't let him go. I love you know? that. I love that scene. I don't know how apocryphal it is in the mm-hmm. uh, in the Benny Goodman story where they uh, Steve Allen played Benny of all cast yes. you know to yes. have him play Benny Goodman. But he ends up in this little little uh, uh, you know a uh, little tiny restaurant. I'm, I'm groping for words. It's just, mm-hmm. it's it's the low end of a restaurant right. on Catalina, mm-hmm. and and Hampton's there. He's the soda jerk, the cook, and while they're eating, he starts playing the vibe. Right. And yeah. I said, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy? Yeah. Well, Lou, what does it feel like to know that you who have reached a level of success and visibility and and some money mm. uh, worked hard for it yeah. uh, are that you are able to lend your name to that cause to give mm. something back I know you get asked that a lot but what's it like when a young kid comes up and says hey you got me my scholarship it's a good feeling to know that I've, I've in some way or other given something back to the people that put me where I am because and I use the analogy, I say, well, you know, I can't go knock on everybody's door that bought my record. But 
somehow, maybe through some of these kids that are coming out of school as lawyers, doctors, you know, physicists, scientists, whatever their particular profession is, they come out and they go back to their community and impart that knowledge and that expertise to the people in that community. Well, that's my way of saying thank you for giving me the chance. That's how I feel about it, you know. And I do have people come up to me frequently and say, hey, thanks, man, but it wasn't for what you're doing. I would never got a chance to go to college. And most of these people that are, sub, uh, that are you know, getting subsidized are the first in their family's history to go to college. And then, of course, financially is impossible. I mean, as you know, and I'm sure everybody else knows, the tuitions are constantly going up. One thing about the UNC, if they do manage to keep the tuitions at a comfortable level, mm -hmm. you know, as far as that so they helped a lot a lot of people you brought back a memory i remember after finally graduating from college mm. i got my student loan payment book back mm. and it almost arrived in a box it looked like a phone book it was i had payments <laughs> i until mm. about three years ago i think mm -hmm. i was trying to pay off the loan yeah Let, let's talk about about lou ross where are you from originally chicago How, chicago yeah Okay, I'm from Southern Indiana, as, as I close, mentioned, and, right and spent, spent a lot of my childhood listening to those great Chicago radio stations, mm, WGM, MAQ, right. yeah, CFL, yeah. all of those. Sid McCoy. Did, yeah, did, did, yeah. Were Daddy you doing music from early on? I, I interviewed well, Bella Reese about two months ago, and she yeah. started out, you know, as a child singing yeah. in the choir. Well, that's the same way I started out. Myself, uh, well, Della, I knew Della when she was singing with the group out of Detroit. The uh, Oh... I remember she was Reverend Runnitz's wife. Yeah, and she mm. was talking about how how hot the clubs were in Chicago. The, oh, there yeah. was a, the D Toronto, Detroit, Chicago, back and forth. Was she was talking about what a wonderful circuit that yeah, it was. was. That was a circuit. But see, I was in, we were, I was singing in the junior choir, and then myself and the late Sam Cook, we formed a teenage quartet. You know, had our little teenage quartets running around the city. And uh, uh, Della was. What was the name of that? Boy, I'm groping for it, too. Mm, I'll get it. It'll come to me. But she was, you know, in Detroit. And, of course, uh, C.L. Franklin, Aretha's father, mm -hmm. he was the, I guess you could say, uh, preacher supreme. He, you know, because once we got big enough to travel, we would go on the call the gospel caravan. And he would be like the minister that would preach the sermon. Of course, he had the five soul stirs out of Chicago. Uh, the Five Blind Boys out of Alabama, the Gospel Harmonettes out of Birmingham, which was a female group, the Fair Fear Four out of Nashville, and uh, the Dixie Hummingbirds, you know. Wow. And it was like a big package traveling on the road. And uh, we, you know, so I knew Della, I mean, you know, as a kid. And then when Della cut Don't You Know and made the transition, mm -hmm. Then, I mean, that was the thing, boy, and everybody was saying, wow, man, Della Reese stopped singing gospel. Well, still being in the gospel field, we were a little, you know, intimidated because yeah. we didn't know how that was going to be accepted. Then when Sam cut You Send Me and the door opened up, said, whoa, hello. And then, of course, Aretha, who was playing piano for her father's church choir, uh, then she cut Respect. Well... You know the rest of that. Is oh, history. absolutely! But uh, that's that's how I think. You know, uh, matter of fact, I would say most of the people from that particular era, myself, Sam Cooke, Aretha Franklin, Patti LaBelle, Gladys Knight, uh, just to name a few. Well, what a lineup! We all came out of the gospel field. We all started out singing in junior choirs in churches. Well, and, and a lot of yeah. people forget that Elvis, uh, the group that backed him up, was the Jordanaires. That's right. I mean, and that was Which, a very interesting marriage mm -hmm. there. Yes, it was. Yeah. But see. And that's another thing. A lot of people, now, you know, they read Elvis's autobiography and stuff. Uh, they don't understand that this man, his musical, I guess you'd say, introduction was on Beale Street, where the B.B. Kings and the Howlin' Wolves and the Lightning Hopkins and the Mom, uh, uh, Big Mama Thornton and those people were performing. And he would go down there and listen to those people. And as far as the all those, those leg movements and things... He took those from Little Richard. He took those from Jackie Wilson and people like that, you know, who were performers, mm -hmm. and they were doing it. But uh, I would say, you know, that uh, the majority of your successful performers, especially vocalists, that came out of the, I would say, the 50s, early 60s, they all had that kind of uh, 
training, like you said, you sure. know, breeding, so, so to speak. Well, Della told me something, and I, I hadn't known much about her background. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, I tell young kids today that there's a whole Della Reese you don't know about. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm playing all those RCA Victor songs on Saturday afternoon. And to me, it's the Della Reese of the 60s and 70s, right. not today. But she was mentioning how uh, Mahalia Jackson had come through and one of right. her backup singers got sick and she went on tour. And she said, I was so cocky. I thought I was doing Mahalia Jackson a favor. Mm, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, well, you know, at that time and in, in that day and age. But she was very honest about yeah. it. And and obviously, you know, I mean, then from then on, all the exposure you got. Sure, well, Della was cute. Yeah, still yeah. is. Yes. Got well, more hair than any of us will ever. <laughs> please, don't you know. Don't you know. That was one of the songs, too. Don't you know. I wish I had all these to play in the background. You. Yeah. And one of the things we were talking about, and I, I'm sure you can relate to this, is before synthesizers, when they have two guys making union scale, doing 18 parts as if they're an orchestra, right. they had some big, big bands, symphonic-style bands, backing well, you up. Well, you see, in those days, the... Uh, uh, there were musicians that just wanted to play. I mean, uh, well, when I first started recording, uh, I would go down, like, I didn't have to worry about, you know, getting it together before I went in the studio. i just go down to Musician Junior because it was always musicians sitting around doing nothing like that. And they would be glad to go in with you, you know, and record. And, and of course, we weren't, I don't know, I can't say we, there wasn't an awareness. I mean, as far as big bands and that big band sound, that was something else, mm-hmm. you know. Because the places that we were working in, you couldn't put. If you'd put a band in there, you couldn't get no people in the place. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was like. So it had to be Lou Rawls like, and the trio, right? <laughs> yeah. If you wanted a big band, then you had to go somewhere else and play. But uh, you know, that was the way that was. But there was, you know, the the, the full instrumentation. Now, when that started happening. Uh, the the cost was not prohibitive at that time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could go in, you could cut an album. I guess you could say maybe for ten thousand dollars, you know, and that was that was a big, big production. You thing. can't pay the engineers for that okay. now. All that post processing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. See, but now I mean, it's gotten cost prohibitive now. As a matter of fact, just studio time alone eat you up. Mm -hmm. I remember, what was it, the Eagles or one of those groups went in the studio and stayed for a year, cut one album. When they came out and they sold the album, sold a million, they didn't make a dime. (laughs) It all had to be eaten up in costs. Only people Mm -hmm. who made any money was the guy who owned the studio. Exactly. Lou, let me ask you about some of the the people you've worked with on the way. 1969, you're you're an established star. You're asked to be on Dean Martin's show. Yeah. What was that like? What was Dino like? Dean was cool. He was a nice man. What you saw was what you got? Yeah. Exactly. That was him. I mean, this man, you'd be there. I'd be there, in, you know, with the gold diggers and Paul Ann and all these people. And we'd be in there waiting for him to come in. He'd drive in in his golf cart. He'd drive right in the studio, park his golf cart, walk over, jump up on the piano and sit down. And that and the show started. Everybody was there. The whole Everybody was there waiting. And when he'd drive in with his golf cart, he'd do this little horn, doot, doot. He said, he's here. Everybody would go to work. Pow! Just like that. So the impression you got at home of a guy who simply walked into an already rehearsed situation Mm -hmm. as if these people had come to his home and he was just sitting back enjoying it, that was the way the show was done. That was him. That was the way it was. What a... (laughs) That's the way it was. What a great format. You know, but then, I mean, his, you know, his, his, his producers and all those people... They, you know, they knew exactly, they knew him. Yeah. And they knew exactly how he worked. And, and they knew how to doing. package him. Right. Yeah. And they put it together. Well, then when when they asked me to host the summer replacement show for him with the Gold Diggers, I said, yeah, right on, man. Because I knew, and I had been working enough on the show that they knew me and knew how I worked because I worked the same way that he did because I just watched him. I said, hey, that's it. That's the answer right there. Isn't there such a thing, and I... I fashioned myself somewhat a singer. That was my college scholarship. But I found out you couldn't both sing and do journalism. They each took too much time. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, maybe I'll be able to type long after I can sing. Isn't there such a thing as over-rehearsing? 
I was in a choir one time where I swear we started going downhill because it's like to, it's like trying to diagnose your golf swing. Right. If it isn't natural after a while, it doesn't work. Well, see, that's the thing that a lot of artists have. I've seen a lot of artists do this, and um, like I said, they'll go in the studio and they will overdo it. I mean, like uh, they will they'll make a cut and they'll listen to it and they say, "Well, we could change this." And they start changing things, and they start changing and changing. After a while, they lose the original mm -hmm. of what it was. They lose it because they start trying to be over creative to the point that they lose the real point of what they're doing. And you say, well, wait a minute, what are you doing? Now, you know, Ellington told me this, Duke Ellington. He said he and, an, and it was a, a producer at Capitol Record Company. He said, let me tell you something, son. If you don't get it in the first three takes, leave it alone. Hmm. Go on to something else, because all you're going to do then is go downhill. Well, you know, something else that kids today don't stop to think, mm. and that is in the era before digital, mm. in the era before tape, you right. went direct to disc, right. and you not only were wasting a lot of mm. acetate, mm. but the, the mindset back then, you listen to some of those great sets that uh, Harry James did. Mm. Some of those have little imperfections. You'll hear a reed squeak right. or whatever. Today mm. they would fix that, but back yeah. then they realized that the whole worked. Right. Let's not tweak with the little parts. Exactly. Well, I remember now uh, this, I, had, I wasn't even recording then, but I was around people in Chicago that were. I remember when they used to do sound effects, you know what they use? The men's room. To make the echo to in the ceramic, the echo, yes. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, this was before all the high tech stuff. Well, I'll give something away in in the mm. War of the Worlds that Orson Welles did when the uh, top comes off the Martian lander mm. and there's this mm. noise. Mm. They actually took the top off. Well, you and I know what a mason jar right. is. I'm not sure. Right. A jelly jar. Yeah. Uh, holding it down in the in the the latrine, mm -hmm. the commode, the with a microphone in there, right. and that's how they created that, that eerie kind of weird yeah. sound. Yeah, And people at home didn't know. It right. just fun. Right. I mean, well, you know, sound effects, that was, I mean, they actually had people that were making, well, like the old radio shows. I remember they were showing this on one of the cable channels. They're called uh, well, Win or something like Wynn, that. Win, W-E-N-N, yeah. on American Movie Classic. And they were showing yeah. how, how they made all the different sound effects and things. And it was really funny. Man. I don't have any cellophane, but mm. let me see if I can sprinkle this up. When mm. they used to make fire, it was yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> it just it, sounded great. I'm mm -hmm. just doing a piece of uh, plastic here. Yeah, but who's that was the it. who's the fellow that put uh, when together? Won a couple of Emmys for some songs. I shouldn't mm. grow up. But anyway, he's a he's a singer. Mm -hmm. uh, and and mm. that was just um, I'll think of it before the interviews. Over. Yeah, let's move ahead a little bit in your career. Early mm. 1970s, you get together with Helen Reddy mm. and Wolfman Jack. Mm -hmm. and and uh, and and take part in a show that just had tons of people on it, and that was a that was a, a <laughs> long not long running but had had a couple of good seasons and a yeah. lot of exposure. Yes, it did. And Helen Reddy was at the top of her form. Yeah, she point. was. Yeah, she had just busted through the top, and I was still up and coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Still waiting for that big break, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, I'm still waiting on it, but. Uh, no, I, I did a lot. You know, I did some a lot of things. Matter of fact, I did a thing called Sailing with Soul, which was a radio show, and it was sponsored by the Navy, but it was for Armed Forces Radio, mm -hmm. and uh, that was interesting because when I first time went overseas and started going around to the military bases, all the guys said, "Hey, Lou, man, right on." You know, I said, "Yeah," and I, you know, it was it was uh, I guess it was uh, exciting, you know going out of the country realizing that people heard me in other parts of the world that I had never, the only thing I knew about them was what they taught me in school or what I saw on television. You know, I think somebody, whether it be on AMC or what, ought to pay tribute to what the military bands have done. Living in mm. D.C. for 20 years, mm. I realized that the Navy had a great show called Serenade in Blue. Right. I didn't know for years it was in stereo as early back as the mm -hmm. 60s. I worked for a monaural radio I recorded station. an album with that, with the, with the band. Some of the best studio musicians in America are mm. in those military bands That's in right. Washington. That's right. That's right. I, I cut an album with the band, with the, with the Navy band. And uh, I did a couple of tracks with the, uh, what was it? Oh. 
Well, they got the airmen of note. Airmen of note. Or the singers, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. The, and then, of course, the, the army's got the singing sergeants. They've yeah. all got great uh, aggregations. But there mm-hmm. are people there who their whole career has been in military. That's right. I mean, really good musicians, too. Al, uh, Herb Albert used to play taps at Arlington Cemetery yeah. when he was in the service. Yeah, boy. <laughs> Lou, what would you say to parents who have a child who's showing some musical aptitude? I mean, we live in a world where if you're not a baseball player, people say, that boy wants to be a dancer. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, people look askance at you if you want to get into the arts. Right. What, what would you say about the importance for parents of giving the child a chance? Well, I think the importance is that they give the chance, give the chance to the child to be expansive and e- e- expressive, to be creative. See, a lot of people will tell their kids, says, I want to play piano, I want to play guitar. Of course, now they are saying, yes, do it, because they realize, you know, what the uh, return can be. But, you see, we, we, as adults, I'll say, we have a tendency to squash our child's creativity because we tell them, oh, you can't do that, or you don't want to do that. Now, that will do one or two things. That will either just take away the desire from the kid or it will turn the kid in another direction, which will usually be the wrong direction because they'll have to go somewhere else to find the acceptance that they're looking for. And then the parents, of course, they get, you know, well, you know, this child, I'm telling you, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. You know, well, hey, what you going to do with them? Let the child... Of course, you keep some restraints on the child. You just don't let the kid go by, you know, just go off into the wild and do weird, crazy stuff. But don't be a deterrent to that creativity. I mean, like uh, I was talking to some what are called psycho- psychologists, and they were saying, you know, we have a lot of abilities that are squashed while we're children. I mean, the psychic thing to be able to, you know, to, uh, uh, what can I say, not predict or anything, mm-hmm. but be, have, be aware, have be the perceptive. awareness, be perceptive. Yeah. We take that away from our children. We stop them. We say, no, you can't do it. You ain't supposed to do that. What do you mean you ain't supposed to do it? If you have the ability to do it and it's not something that's going to be detrimental, why can't you do it? But we do that. We tell them no. They, the first thing they learn as they're growing up is no. They learn no before they learn yes. Sure. Okay. (laughs) They learn no. That's the first word they learn. See, I feel so fortunate as a child in that I was so hyper. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I I say this jokingly, but I don't know how I survived without my parents throwing me up against a wall. I mean, you can tell by talking to me now, I'm a hyper Mm -hmm. kind of person. Mm -hmm. But back, you know, if I'd been born now instead of back in the late 40s, they would have given me Ritalin or one of these Mm -hmm. depressants they Mm -hmm. had. But my dad realized that I love music. I used to cry when I heard mm. symphonic music when I was a little kid. He went to my first grade teacher, this wonderful old nun named Sister Mary Grace, mm. and said, why is my son crying when he hears good music? And mm. she apparently said, because it's pretty. Mm. Yeah. And so she, after school, she'd play uh, classical music and jazz and all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And she gave me an outlet to understand that this was okay. Mm-hmm. That it's yeah. all right to get involved in all that. Where, mm-hmm. if I'd had a different kind of parent or a different kind of school situation, mm-hmm. they would have said, shut up and sit in the back of the room. Exactly. And that's what and I'll say, well, up until uh, in the last few years, that's what parents would do. But now they look and they see like the, you know, like the, the Jackson family come along, you know, the Michael Jacksons and and these other kids who all of a sudden they go in and next thing you know, wham, they're they're star, man. You know, they are doing good. They're making, creating good music and stuff. I mean, look at television now, man. We got more kids on television than they ever had in history. And who was it? W.C. Fields said, there's two things you don't ever want to be with. And that's a child and an animal because they, <laughs> you know, they're going to put you out of business. But that's the thing, you know. So you say, well... Uh, now, like I said, now in this day and age, everybody, they're pushing their kids. I mean, mm-hmm. in my building where our office is, they've got one of those casting agents that cast children for commercials and stuff like that and, and acting parts. I mean, it's a steady stream mm. of kids coming in there, steady. And they don't come in until like after 2 or 3 in the afternoon because they got to get out of school. But you can believe me, the parents are there with them. Just like clockwork. Just like it. I'm telling you, man, it's a whole steady stream of them coming in and out of the building. But that's because now the industry now looks to children 
and animals mm-hmm. as drawing cards. Sure. You know. For at one time, early on, except for the little rascals and a few mm-hmm. other things, th- right. there was no outlet for a child in no. the media. Mm-mm. No. And if you saw a kid in the movie, it was only because the kid would, would you know, uh, they would refer to the kid as, this is my child, that's my son. They had to be daughter. there because of the plot. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But now, I mean, they're creating plots around the kid itself. The kid becomes the, the sure. story, you know. Lou, let me shift gears here and, and, and go back to something, and that is, uh, as as many singers, you started out in, in church. Mm-hmm. Uh, what memories do you have of, of that aspect of your life, the importance of, we're talking about keeping kids healthy and sane, of mm-hmm. religion, of a little bit of discipline in a child's life? Well, it was direction. See, it was direction. Now, I'm sure that you'll get a lot of calls about what I'm going to say, but it was direction. And you see... It was extended family. See, in the neighborhood I grew up in, well, the church I went to, everybody knew who you were. They knew who your parents were. And if they saw you doing something out in the street wrong, they'd call you on it. But they didn't call it child abuse. They called it caring. And if they saw you doing something, they might come up, if it was something that was really drastic, they might come up and grab you and shake you. But then they would call your house and tell your folks. See, which you didn't want to happen because you knew you were going to really get it then, right? But that was the thing. It was a thing where people showed care. And it was like extended family. Today, they don't have that. Today, you got kids growing up in inner cities, don't know who they are, where they are, where they're going. Why? Because we've taken that away from them. Now, uh, you got, you know, kids out there. I call it children raising babies, you know? And what is that? And then we look at them and say they're wrong and they're doing wrong and they're going to be wrong and this is going to happen to them and that's going to happen to them. But do we take the time to really get involved with them? And we can't really because now we've got such such rules and regulations that they've come up with. That's why these kids are going all astray. Because you just can't. If I walk down the street and I see a kid, you know, writing graffiti or something on the wall, and I say, kid, don't do that. That's bad. You don't want nobody to do that on your house, do you? And they'll turn around and they'll, you know, you know, full letter word me and, you know. Or pull a gun. You, right. Yeah. You know, so, um, you know, you're saying, you say, well, Jesus Christ, man, what am I doing? You know, I'm just trying to keep the kid from doing something stupid and getting caught and, you know, probably go to jail for something. But if you do that, like you say, the kid might pull a gun on you. You don't know. But that's because our society, and this may be, you know, I'm sure I'm going to get some response on this. Our society has created this monster. Well, now, how did our generation drop the ball on that, though? Hey. I mean, I hate to blame myself well, and you and everyone well, else, well, but... Well, we got to take the blame because we let... Now, listen to this. We let the so-called leaders create this monster. And instead of us stepping forward and saying, wait a minute, you're going to tell me that if I catch my kid doing something wrong, catch him stealing or... or, or you know, using dope or something like this. I can't chastise him. If I chastise him, it's going to be called child abuse. See, like my folks used to tell me, I brought you here and I can take you away. <laughs> you know well, saying? you know the old joke I mentioned. Mm-hmm. I had nuns. I went to mm-hmm. Catholic schools. We all have big, fat knuckles. You right, know? from the and, ruler. And the parents told mm-hmm. the schools, I guess you can't do this in public schools, mm-hmm. but the parents more or less told the nuns, if my son needs to be slapped, you have my they permission. Did. Wait, they did don't. Beat them up too much. They did it in the public schools in Chicago. My my grandmother would come to school and tell the teacher if he, if 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 Lou if Lou do something wrong, whip him, hmm. you know, but make him drop the pants because I don't want to tear him up. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but I say this. Thank God for that kind of upbringing. Sure. Because if it were not for that, I probably wouldn't be here today. Neither. Yeah. I mean, because you know, let's face it. In this day and age. Uh, I look at it this way. If if you live to be past 21 years old, you have created something really good. Mm-hmm. And this, because, I mean, let's face it, you're almost afraid to come out of your house. There's so much craziness out in the street. But why? Because we create all of these rules and regulations that take away the ability to say don't or that's wrong. The other night, Tom Snyder, 
mm-hmm. the talk show host, was talking about the fact that he saw this kid on a street corner, obviously lost, who little boy, 10, 11 years old, started to talk to him. But then he thought, now, wait a minute. Here I am, an older man with a younger boy. Mm-hmm. Somebody might misunderstand that. Yes. He said 20 years ago, he might have taken him to his house or given mm-hmm. him some money for food or something. Mm-hmm. But he said, I wonder who's watching. Right. And he said, all of a sudden, I was prevented from helping because Mm -hmm. somebody might get the wrong idea. Exactly. And why would they do that? Because our society has created this monster. You know, sure. I mean, of course, we know child abuse has been going on for hundreds, thousands of years. Yeah, but there's a big difference between child abuse right. and discipline. Exactly. I mean, obviously, neither one of us is in mm. favor of brutalizing a child. No, but, no, no. but a parent but should disi- know when to stop. Disciplined. Yeah. That's the word, discipline. If you don't get disciplined, then what are you going to have? You're going to have the opposite of that. An anarchy. Okay. Sure. But yet, everybody sits back and says, well, I don't know what's wrong with them. I know what's wrong with them. You ain't telling them what's right or wrong. you just letting them go. You know, I mean, we got what they call the latchkey kids, who their parents have to work, you know, because they have to. Sure. So what does that mean? The kid is on their own. From the time they get up in the morning and leave home and go to school and then come back, they're on their own until the parents come home from work. All right. Well, now, in that period of time, God knows what could happen and what does happen. Does the parent take the time to find out? Some of them do. Most of them don't because they're tired. They've been working hard all day. They want to come home, eat some dinner, kick back, watch a little news, and go to bed. Okay? Now, then when they get notes from the school, if they ever get the note, or they get a call from the school. Or if they know how to find the school. Right. Yeah. Then they're going to jump on the kid and say, what is this? I'm out here working. I'm doing all this. I'm doing that. And you up here messing up. What's going on? Well, hey, give them a chance. Talk to them. Find out what they're doing. Be involved in their lives. But we don't because our society has created this monster that says you got to do this and you ain't got time to do that. And that's that. But then our same society that created the monster is the first one to grab these kids and want to incarcerate them without, you, with, you know, and they do them. They put them away. But do they train them to do anything? No. They warehouse. Them. Right. That's the way it works. Yes. And, you know, the great babysitter we have television. Maybe I, at age 50, am a fuddy-duddy, mm-hmm. but I don't watch TV. Mm-hmm. When I travel, though, and I get stuck in a motel room, mm-hmm. I watch TV. I was offended mm-hmm. by what's available on the movie channels <laughs> uncensored in a right. hotel room. Right. Now, sure, it's nice to have HBO, mm-hmm. but I don't understand it. And then I, I played a little game. I got my clicker, and I went across the channel, and in every other scene, somebody was pointing a gun at somebody. That's right. And what does that teach a child? Well, you know what? I mean, you're talking about the television. Same thing in the movie theaters. They Worse. make these, they make these, you know, these gargantuous movies, just um, you know, a zillion dollars, and all the movie is about is who can kill the most. You know, can Arnold Schwarzenegger kill more than Bruce Willis did? Can he kill more than James Bond did? You know, and what is that? Or you take a good movie, mm-hmm. which doesn't really need to be. PG-17 or whatever, mm-hmm. could could actually have as good a plot and let more younger kids see it, and then they throw a little scene here and there which they think is necessary, and it mm-hmm. becomes an adult picture all yes. of a sudden. Yes. That's why I watch American movie classics. Mm-hmm. I pretend it's 1939, the war hasn't started, and cry over some Ginger you know, Rogers movie, hey, and my friends think I'm crazy. But you know what's funny, though, man? You look at those movies, you look at the, at the movie channel, and you watch those movies, and they didn't have special effects. The special effects were like they used to do on radio, right? It was in your mind. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you never saw, I mean, they had Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman. You never saw the Wolfman catch nobody. You heard him yelling and screaming. You never saw Dracula bite nobody. He would, you'd see him come into the room, throw up the cape, but you never saw him bite, right? Frankenstein, you might see him throw somebody up against the wall. Mm-hmm. You see the Wolfman chasing somebody through the woods, but you never saw him catch him. You well, know? Alfred Hitchcock said it best. Mm-hmm. He said, the greatest moment the audience has is of the anticipation exactly. that something's going to happen. Right. And then you just, you know, in your own mind, you visualize this thing, you know, and that could be any way you want to. Sure. It could be the Wolfman <laughs> ripping somebody up or it could be Dracula, you know, biting something, you know, but you had to figure that out in your own mind. You didn't have to sit there and see, I mean, actually see like, you know, pulling your arm. What is that? Please, man. I mean, even 
was it when Frankenstein? I think it was Frankenstein, one of the old Frankenstein movies where the uh, the lieutenant of the police had lost his arm because Frankenstein had pulled it off, but mm -hmm. you didn't see him do no, it. No, you heard you, about it. Yeah, you yeah. saw him <laughs> walking around with one arm. Yeah. You know, said, "Wow, man, that dude got lost his arm." You know, but. Sounds like you like radio as much as I do. Yeah. I love listening to the radio. You hear mm. the old radio, some of the stations here I in bought, town run those old shows? I bought some of those tapes. Yeah. The old Amos and Andy radio shows and a lot of those different shows. And they're great. Yeah. Because they always made you use your imagination, which they don't do today. I heard an episode of Suspense a couple of months ago of somebody trapped in an elevator, mm -hmm. and I did the old thing, turned out all the lights, mm -hmm. laid down in bed, closed my eyes. I've mm -hmm. got goosebumps. Yeah. I mean, it's like in a sanctum mysteries, oh, yeah. you know. I even cry at the end of The Lone Ranger when nope. he goes off. I, just, <laughs> I love that. But well, those but those are things where you had to use your own imagination and be creative. Like as kids, we used to we'd go to the movie and see a cowboy movie. We'd go back home. We'd make us a horse out of a broomstick or whatever, you know. And we would we would create all those things. We'd build us little forts and stuff, you know. That, sure. But we used our imagination, our creativity and to do that. And didn't need stuff. batteries. Right, exactly. No, batteries were well, battery couldn't afford them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Batteries for flashlights. That was it, you know. But uh they've taken all that away. They 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 now I would guess you could say overproduce. Yeah. To the point that you don't have to use your mind to be creative about nothing. All you got to do is just sit there, you know, and be bar bombarded with all of the stuff that they do. And I by mean, the time you buy the ticket and the popcorn, it's 20 bucks. Forget about it. Yeah. Forget about it. I mean, like, I know, Walt, you're going to turn in your grave, but they're raising the price to Disneyland. I know. You know? I heard that the other day. That's, say, well, that's sickening. I mean, come on, man. Listen, I could do a whole show, and I don't want to get myself sued here, but mm. the morale among a lot of the employees at Disneyland is very low. As far as them, they're one minute late here. Now they've mm. moved the parking lot for the kids who work there so far away they can't get to work it's on time. It's almost in San Diego. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> it's like, it's, you, know, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, was, I, I did a show down at uh, Disney World in Florida. Of course, down there, I guess, they still keep a pretty, uh, I don't say tight rain, but pretty uh consistency there because mm -hmm. i was the first the funny thing when they started their that 25th anniversary thing well see i was one i was the second act to play disney world in florida hmm. and the, when they only had the one hotel the contemporary hotel yeah i was the second act so they invited me to come back for the 25th anniversary thing and i did and uh, then i went back uh here a couple of months ago and played in uh, what they call Pleasure Island, and uh, I st still saw that it's still, you know, uh, controlled, I guess you could say is the right word, as to how they treat the people and how they react and all that. Now, I didn't get a chance to talk to a lot of the employees, just the people that I work with there, but they seem to have been pretty, you know, happy with the way things were being run there. They're pretty well run separately. Yeah, they, they are. It's yeah, two different yeah. worlds. Two different worlds. It is. You know, and then you go overseas, the one they got there in Japan, of course, the one in Europe, in uh, France, they, <laughs> the French people say, you you stupid Americans worship a mouse. <laughs> 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 well, it's going to be a while before the red ink gets washed off that place, yeah. I tell you. Mm -hmm. Lou, two quick questions to wrap things up. Are you aware of the fact of what a wonderfully interesting voice you have? Not only singing, well, but speaking. It is so distinctive. Well, yeah, you know, it's a funny thing. I can be on the elevator with somebody and be talking, and people turn around and say, I wasn't sure, but when you opened your mouth, I knew it was you. Because <laughs> that's, that's something. I, my voice, you know, they did a, a Budweiser, and Isaac Bush did a survey, and they found that the three most recognized voices in the world Muhammad Ali, Howard Cosell, and Lou Rawls. Wow. That blew me away. I said, you got to be kidding in the world, man. But then they were running the Budweiser, you know, commercials and stuff. And, you know, then actually being on the shows like Dean Martin, people, the different television shows that I've been on that have been worldwide exposure. I've gotten that kind of recognition. I'm trying to think of the black singer, older fellow, died a couple, three years ago, had the... I'm hearing a Lowenbrow commercial, if I may mention a competitor being sung. And I Arthur can't... Price. I... No, no, no. I'm. I'll think of it after we get off the air. But he had this low, Lowenbrow. Yeah, and he'd been around, I guess, maybe since the 30s. But hmm. uh, 
minute we get off the air, I'll think about it. No, I'm just trying to think who would that one price sock. No, it wasn't was. Arthur Price sock. Oh, one final thing. What's next? What what projects you you working on now? Well, I'm working on my my uh, tributes, my tributes, not tributes, salutes. I'm saluting Sam Cooke, Duke Ellington, and Louis Armstrong. I'm gonna do three specials on them because, you know, I feel like these are people that should be. I mean, Sam. I mean, the man. He 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 created a lot of great music, and he made a great contribution to the world of music as far as African Americans are concerned. Because beside Nat King Cole, he was the first, I guess you could say, to be what they called a crossover, mm-hmm. you know, singer. Because you they they call, of course, when he recorded "You Send Me" in the '60s, they still didn't give the average African American singer the recognition of being a pop star. Nat King Cole, of course. Mm-hmm. But yet but, Nat King Cole couldn't get sponsorship for his television for his show, TV even though show. he was a megastar. All right, time. exactly. But Sam, with you see me, they called it an R&B song. And I'm, standing, I'm saying, Jesus, who, who who, was the person that made that designation? Some white guy. You know, R&B, <laughs> you send me, R&B. I mean, you know, but uh, uh, that, so I'm doing that. I'm, and, uh, of course, Ellington this year uh, would be his 100th birthday had he lived. Wow. And, of course, Armstrong, I mean, this man, I mean, he was universal. I mean, this man was loved and respected all over the world. Don't we really forget what a worldwide star he was? I mean, I'm picturing him in in movie High Society with Bing Crosby, who was probably, at the time, the other big worldwide star from here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, see, that's what I mean. And then you've got, got, what, the last three generations, a kid that didn't even know who that was. And if you yeah. don't keep someone's memory alive, when our mm-hmm. generation dies out, who's going to care? Okay. And that's sad. That's it. That's yeah. very sad. You know, like people say, well, uh, you know, you can even go back to uh, people today. You talk about the vocal groups. Now they talk like today, talk about all for one boys to me and like this. What about the uh, Blue Notes, the Five Satins, the Moon Glows, the Drifters, Clyde McFadder. These were big people. These people opened the door for the guys that's coming along today, but they don't even know nothing about these people. Mm-mm. Every once in a while, one of them might, because their parents have saved the, the old 78s or the 45s, you know, or the old vinyl records, which were great. I mean, because today, you know, you look at a, you get a CD, you got to get a magnifying glass to see the album cover. Can't read the liner <laughs> you notes. You know what I'm saying, <laughs> right? And that was one of the big things sure. about those albums, man. But uh, these kids today, I mean, if we and if we don't keep this kind of stuff alive, it's going to be lost. I was talking to a fellow in my apartment building the other week about talk shows, and he was said something. He said, "You do a weekly talk show." I said, "Yeah, I do an interview mm-hmm. show." He said, "Well, let's see." And he starts naming Leno and Letterman and mm-hmm. da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. And I said, "You know, if it hadn't have been for Steve Allen." None of those people would have been there. And he looked at me and said, who? Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, Lord. Right. Yeah, you know, you know it like, hurt me and that Steve, he didn't know who he was. Right. And Steve Allen was one of the first, he was the first talk show, him and Jack Parr. Oh, God but love him. Steve was the first person to bring jazz musicians on his show. And he, he really t- told me he wants to be remembered as a musician That's right. more than anything else. That's right. Yeah. He's a philanthropist, a writer, and all that stuff. Now what can't he do? You know? And so, um, it, it, you know, it's something, and you, you try. That's why I'm doing these, these specials. These, Because I said, you know, those are talents that should not ever, ever, shouldn't be forgotten. I mean, Ellington, Jesus, this man wrote 6,000 or 7,000 songs. I'm talking real music. Yes. You know, music that will be played eons and eons from now. I dare you, you know? to go to any cabaret, any night of the week, anywhere in the U.S., and, mm-hmm. and go 20 minutes without hearing some Duke Ellington element right. in what the guy's playing. That's right. You're right. No question about that. And, uh, you know, when all of these different trends and changes have come and gone, that have come and gone in the last, what, 10 years? I mean, like, who was number one yesterday, right? You know? Or this morning. <laughs> right. I mean, that uh, that music 
will still be there. Yeah. It will still be the foundation and substance of what real music is about. Well, Lou, you continue to bring a lot of us uh, some wonderful moments. You're blessed with a gorgeous voice. And, yes, uh, I am blessed with that. That's true. Thank and God. I want to thank you for taking the time to brave our intermittent bad weather here to come see us. Yeah, well, listen, it was a pleasure for me. I would have been here on time, but it was raining. And people, oh, it rains you here know two what three happens? days a year. But you know what happens? It's amazing to me. All the people, most of the people here are from the Midwest, the East, right, mm -hmm. and the South, where rain is a normal thing. They come out here, and the first drop of water hits the ground, they panic, man. Oh, my God, it's raining. And they forget how to drive, you know. I saw more fender benders and bumper jumpers on my way. <laughs> I said, wow. well, I'm going to have to take it easy. And I'm going to let Dennis come to explain to him that... Uh, no problem. It's some, it's some people out here, cars are driving themselves. And especially when you see them cars that are the biggest tanks, and you see just the top of the head, you know, just the top of the head is a person driving a 1969 or 70 Buick or Cadillac as big as a truck, right? <laughs> there was a woman in my hometown who must have been about 4'8", mm -hmm. who had a big 56 DeSoto, and it was a ship's wheel steering wheel. Yeah, right. You could just see her gray hair. Mm -hmm. And you're right. You, yeah. If you didn't look right, you thought, that's a runaway car. Yes, <laughs> right. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> oh, well, you know, you got to just, you have to drive for them. Yeah. See, they said, well, do you pay attention when you're driving? I said, yes, I pay attention to everybody. <laughs> well, Lou, God bless you for your good works, and thanks for coming by. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to all the people out there listening, and thank you for supporting me and the educational fundraiser, because there's a lot of minds out there thirsting for knowledge. All they need is a chance, and let's face it, you might benefit from what they turn out to be. Who knows? Thanks, Lou. Thank you. He was a great singer and a humanitarian. Lou Rawls. I'm Dennis Daly. <laughs>